That is a beautiful preview of Good Friday, which is coming. That peace always shows up on that day. Uh, and maybe Monday Thursday, too. Uh, so good preview here on the second Sunday of Lent of what's just down the road. Welcome to the worship of God at First Baptist Church on this second Sunday in Lent. I have uh, a handful of things uh, to announce this morning. The first, and I, I don't do this often, but when I find out uh, it's fair game, uh, Stan Alexander, <laughs> how you doing back here? On Thursday, Stan turned 35 years old, celebrated another birthday. <laughs> But that's not what I'm really announcing. Uh, on Friday, Stan and Thornley celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Um, and we want to say congratulations to you uh, as, as your church family. So that's a big milestone and a good milestone. Um, the, the next thing I want to say is uh, 4 o'clock today, the deacons will meet. And then 5.30, not 6.30, right, Wiggy? 5.30? He's nodding. 5.30 on Wednesday is the business meeting. Uh, that's 5.30, not 6.30. So just make a note of that. Um, we put that out earlier but got it wrong here. Um, the third announcement I have is Easter lilies. I know it seems early, I mean, especially with the snow outside. But Easter lilies have to be ordered early. Please order Easter lilies. They add to Easter Sunday so much. And you get to do it in honor or memory of somebody that you love. And we print that for that Sunday. So order those. You can do that by calling the church office. The phone works. We got a new number finally. It only took 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> AT&T. But we got a new number. You can call that number and order Easter lilies. Please do it soon if you're going to do it uh, because Bo, the florist, needs that. Um, the last thing I want to say is that if you're not yet tuning into the podcast, you're missing uh, some of the best fun that I'm having. This past week, uh, I, I interviewed my mentor, James Lampkin over in Asheville about the Camino de Santiago and this coming week, wait for it, Ranger Carol. That's right, Carol Borneman I interviewed. Uh, Carol Borneman and I talk about the park and talk about the, uh, the origin story of the Amish community coming to stay with the Baptists in Middlesboro to work on the national park. So uh, you better answer that. It might be Jesus. <laughs> um, but uh, Carol, Carol and I, Wednesday, that'll go live. Uh, you, you, if you need help getting that, podcasts are really easy. Just send me an email and I'll hook you up. So want to make that note as well. Last thing I'm going to say is why in the world... Did Zach put The Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh on the bulletin? What in the world's that about? Well, look at the sermon title. Yeah, to me nothing says the greatness of God like The Starry Night, and nobody ever painted it quite like Vincent Van Gogh. That's the emphasis of this uh, service today as we lean into the second Sunday of Lent. And as we lean in, let's read together this call to worship based on Psalm 27. The psalmist sings, One thing I asked of the Lord, that I will seek after. Sisters and brothers, God is good, and in love and mercy greets us here. Welcome to worship.
Let's sing together a hymn of praise, hymn number 335, Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. And will you stand as we sing? In any service of worship, and especially in a service of worship in Lent, we observe together a time of confession and assurance of forgiveness. That is printed in your order of worship beneath the starry night, and it is based, as you can see, on the lectionary scripture passages that are offered us today for worship. Uh, would you join me and Beth? as we take this time in this season to say to God, we're broken, we're sorry, and thank you. The Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? Let's pray. Merciful God, you've made us citizens of heaven, but we confess that we have not set our minds on, we have set our minds on earthly things. We have let our desire for security to our dominion to serve the poor. We've let our fear of danger curb our obligation to love our enemies. We have let our love of enemies dull our generosity. 
We have let our craving for public status prevent our honesty about hidden sins. Yet you know the desires of our hearts, and nothing is hidden from you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, conform our sin-weakened bodies to the glory of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ for the world. Amen. Amen. First John tells us God is love, and when we confess, we are assured of forgiveness. God, our light and our salvation, does not forsake us or leave us with our sin. In Christ we are forgiven, and all are forgiven of repentance. Thanks be to God.
Amen. Today's first lesson, which is printed under Starry Night, if you want to follow along, is from the book of Genesis. That's the first book of the Bible. Book of Genesis, the 15th chapter. After these events, the Lord's word came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your protector. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you possibly give me since I have no children? The head of my household is Eliezer, a man from, D from Damascus. He continued, since you haven't given me any children, the head of my household will be my heir. The Lord's word came immediately to him. This man will not be your heir. Your heir will definitely be your own biological child. Then he brought Abram outside and said, look up at the sky. Count the stars if you think you can count them. He continued, this is how many children you will have. Abram trusted the Lord, and the Lord recognized Abram's high moral character. He said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. But Abram said, Lord God, how do I know that I will actually possess it? He said, bring me a three-year-old female calf, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a dove, and a young pigeon. He took all these animals, split them in half, and laid the halves facing each other, but he didn't split the birds. When vultures swooped down on the carcasses, Abram waved them off. After the sun set, Abram slept deeply. A terrifying and deep darkness settled over him. After the sun had set and darkness had deepened, a smoking vessel with a fiery flame passed between the split open animals. That day, the Lord cut a covenant with Abram. To your descendants, I will give this land from Egypt's river to the great Euphrates, together with the Kenites and the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites and the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephraim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Jebusites. I almost got it right. Here ends the first lesson. The second lesson we have today is from the Gospel according to Luke. The next day, when Jesus, Peter, John, and James had come down from the mountain, a large crowd met Jesus. A man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to take a look at my son, my only child. Look, a spirit seizes him, and without any warning, he screams. It shakes him and causes him to foam at the mouth. It tortures him and rarely leaves him alone. I begged your disciples to throw it out, but they couldn't. Jesus answered, You faithless and crooked generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him down and shook him violently. Jesus spoke harshly to the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. Everyone was overwhelmed by God's greatness. One of my old professor, uh, Old Testament professors at Georgetown College uh, always made a terrible joke 
about the listing of ites in that passage I read. And you know, preachers specialize in terrible jokes. Uh, the parasites should have been there too. Yeah, see how bad that is? But I could not stop myself from doing it. <laughs> and I'm going to laugh at it even if you don't. <laughs> A lot's going on in that gospel lesson Beth just read. A lot is going on. The next day it begins, and that signals an immediate transition from the story that comes before it. What is that story? The transfiguration. We've been talking about that for a couple of weeks now. The next day is the day after Jesus is transfigured alongside Moses and Elijah atop a mountain. Just like Moses, Jesus comes down the mountain and meets a great crowd full of needs. And a man from the crowd, or maybe from behind the crowd or the edge of the crowd, shouts over the rest. This man clearly knows the stories of his faith. He suspects that Jesus has just encountered the divine and is coming down with a word from God just like Moses did, just like Elijah did before him. The man knows the stories of his faith and hopes that the word from God is mercy. A lot's going on in this gospel lesson that Beth just read. There's the question of demon possession. Just as we wouldn't blindly import the cosmologies or the social structures of the first century into the 21st century, we should be careful about importing the medical worldview of the first century into our own. Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, the man shouts over the crowd, my only child. It's not something that we would say today. It's the word teacher that doesn't fit for us. You see, we would go to ARH. We would go to Park West. We would go to UK or UT hospitals and ask this question. We would ask it in mostly the same way, but not exactly. We would say, doctor, doctor, look, Something is seizing him. Something's wrong. He screams. He shakes. He even foams at the mouth a little bit, and it's scaring me. It tortures him, whatever's got a hold of him, and it happens all the time. That's more the way we would say it 20 centuries later with a different medical worldview. In my untrained medical ear, I hear epilepsy, maybe. Epilepsy had to be a terrifying condition to a pre-scientific mind. And of course, when you're terrified, you turn to God. And Jesus represents God in front of these people. Epilepsy would have merited a social outcast status in the ancient world, too. That's why I said this guy is probably standing on the periphery somewhere, the edge of the crowd, shouting over them as they push him away. Remember Mark 5? Remember the man who lived among the tombs, broke the chains in the region of the Gerasenes? Perhaps it was the same condition Perhaps it wasn't, but note his outcast status. He's outcast. He lives among the tombs. No one was tough enough to control him, the text tells us in Mark 5. Thus, no one went near him. That's why he's living in the tombs. Night and day, he howled and cut himself with stones when the teacher shows up, the man spits, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. 
It may or may not have been the same condition, but this man asked for the same thing that the father in Luke 9 asked for. He asked for mercy. Swear that you won't torture me, he says. And notable, at least to me, is the prescription that Jesus sends home with both the man in Mark 5 and the boy in Luke 9. In Mark 5, Jesus says, go home to your own people. Go home. Home is a place that he wouldn't have been in a long time, wouldn't have been welcome in a long time. Go home and tell them about God's mercy. In Luke 9, the Bible says, Jesus gave him back to his father. We could miss that. We could just write that off as the logistics, but we could miss that giving him back to his father is giving him back to his family, which means giving him back to his community. It's another way of saying, go home. Go home and tell them of God's mercy. You see, part of the cure that Jesus offers these people is the re-stitching together of the social fabric that has been torn by these conditions. Part of the cure that Jesus offers is re-inclusion in community. It happens over and over again. Jesus is always telling people to go home. Sometimes he says, tell them all about it. Sometimes he tells them not to, and they do anyway. But he's always giving that prescription to people. In 1959, uh, from 1959 to 1990, Dr. Murray Bowen worked at the Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, D.C., as a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry, 59 to 90, he saw a lot of stuff develop. And later, he was the director of uh, family programs and the founder of the uh, Family Center for the Study of Family at Georgetown University. Today, it bears his name, the Bowen Center at Georgetown University. Bowen's area of research and expertise was schizophrenia. He found that when he tried to treat schizophrenic patients individually, they didn't make much progress at all. But he got a grant and he started hospitalizing whole families. <laughs> Can you imagine today? I don't know if you could do that today, but he did. He got the nuclear family around the schizophrenic patient and he put them all into treatment. And when he did this, the schizophrenic patient showed improvement more often than not. Isn't that fascinating? To treat the person individually, to hold them at a distance, to treat them as if it's only their problem didn't work but to treat them in the context of their community, their family, had effect. Part of it was reducing the hyper-focus on the patient alone and looking at the whole group. Part of it, I think, was re-stitching together the social fabric that had been torn by the affliction Science, it would seem, says that mercy and inclusion are powerful medicine. And notice Jesus' rebuke in Luke 9. I think it's related. You faithless and crooked generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? And then Jesus turns, I think, from looking at the group to looking at the man holding his son on the periphery. Bring your son 
here. Do you see it? There's the group. Jesus rebukes the group. This man in all likelihood lives on the periphery of the group. And Jesus says to him, bring your son here. Back to this community that has cast you out. Back to this community that doesn't want much to do with you. Back to this community that has judged you. Jesus says, bring your boy home. Home. A lot is going on in this gospel lesson that Beth read. And the last line matters, I think. Everyone was overwhelmed by God's greatness. Everyone was overwhelmed by God's greatness. I punched the word overwhelmed into a thesaurus. I got a lot of interesting words. Yeah, I did. Because, you know, I hear overwhelmed and I think we use that word all the time. I'm overwhelmed by my kids. Yep. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed at work, school. Uh, I'm overwhelmed in retirement by all the things that I've taken on. Um, I'm overwhelmed. We use that word all the time, but that word is very angular, nuanced. Here, here are some of the definitions that come out of the thesaurus. Overcome. Devastated, crushed, overpowered, swamped, conquered, dominated, vanquished, subjugated, dazed, and dazzled. That's quite a list of words. That really shapes out that word that we lose the meaning of because we use it so often. I note that Dazzled made the list. You've heard Dazzled just recently, haven't you? I didn't make this up. It's in the dictionary. Yeah, but you've heard that recently. I have too. Dazzled, as in in the state of Jesus' clothes, and Peter, James, and John's spirits atop the Mount of Transfiguration, dazzling white, dazzling face, Moses' dazzling face. Yeah, how about that? The word dazzling makes the cut. Jesus, it seems, brings the dazzling light and power of God down the mountain with him just like Moses did, and it devastates, overpowers, conquers, subjugates the community's prejudice against this outcast father and his son. And then it dazes and dazzles them all with God's greatness. That's the last line. They were all, everybody, amazed at God's greatness. What did God's greatness look like? What well, looked like mercy. Mercy for these two. A lot's going on in this gospel lesson Beth just read. And whatever else there is to talk about today from Luke 9, it seems to me that the thesis statement here at the bottom of the Mount of Transfiguration is the same as it was atop the Mount of Transfiguration. Atop the Mount, Peter blurts out, it's so good that we're here. Yeah, it's so good that we're here. All this stuff's going on, all this crazy, holy, theophany stuff's going on, and Peter makes it about him. And a cloud blows in while Peter's still talking, overshadows him, and he and James and John are overcome with awe. To me, it sounds like, shh, hush, Peter, just be at home in this moment. 
That's at the top of the mountain. At the bottom of the mountain, the same mountain, wherever it was, Jesus says or speaks harshly to the unclean spirits. That's what it says. Jesus speaks harshly to the unclean spirit. I think the words are right there. I think what he said to the spirit is right there. You faithless and crooked generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? You hear it? And then he heals the child. And then he gives the child back to the father. Come here. He rebukes the groups, the communities, the families, judgmentalism and exclusion of this outcast. And he apparently touches the outcast, which you're not supposed to do in that culture. And then he gives the outcast back to his daddy in the presence of of everyone there. He sends the boy and his father home. Hmm. It sounds like mercy to me. We 21st century readers of stories like this one can get lost in the strange terrain of the text. There's a lot going on in this short passage in the Bible. In our day-to-day, -day, we speak a different language than ancient Palestinians did. Our different language constructs a different worldview, a worldview shot through with science and medicine and technology. We can get lost in the strange terrain of a text like this if we don't slow down, step back, and have a good, slow look at it. A lot's going on in this gospel lesson that Beth just read that might dazzle and overwhelm us, but the thesis of this text and the one before it, the thesis of the story atop the Mount of Transfiguration and at the bottom is mercy heals. Mercy for Peter, mercy for these people. The way I see it, we're all of two minds here. Us in the 21st century who come and listen to sermons and try to live the way God wants us to. We're all of two minds here. One part of us, when we hear mercy heals, goes to a place, a memory, where we remember that somebody showed us mercy and remember how it healed us. Yeah, somebody in your life's done that for you somewhere along the line. Probably more than one somebody. And part of us goes there, and that's very good. But part of us, when we hear mercy heals, recoils, snarls, maybe foams at the mouth just a little about the ones from whom we withhold mercy. That is about as human as it gets. Part of us goes there, part of us goes there. That's about as human as it gets. In the recesses of our minds and hearts, the parts we seldomly name when we are gathered together as Christ's church, we like to feel as if maybe, just maybe, we deserved a little bit of our mercy. We deserved it. And that feeling almost invariably leads to another. They don't. It's so hard to feel that you deserve mercy on the one hand and not go to they don't on the other. They don't. That's as human as it gets. You see, each of us can see our own insides, right? 
Each of us can see our own insides, our, our motives, our historical story, our emotional complexity. But we can't see that in other people. It creates a bias. We look upon others and we see their skin, their hair, their posture. We hear a handful's worth, just a handful's worth of their lifetime's worth of words. We hear just a handful's worth and no more than that of a lifetime's worth of actions and we just can't help it. We don't like them. We don't like them. That's about as human as it gets. I would suggest today that you know precious few people well enough to judge them like the folks in this gospel lesson judge this father and his son. Precious few. Maybe your kids. Maybe. But they grow up and they move on and they get outside of your constant gaze. So maybe not. Maybe, just maybe, your best friend or your spouse. Maybe. Though I'm sure you know what judgmentalism will get you there. I don't have to tell you that. And if not them, then who? Who do we know well enough that we could judge them for anything? Who do we know well enough to judge them like that crowd at the foot of the Mount of Transfiguration? Maybe there's one, maybe there's one that we do know well enough. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's me. Maybe that's who I know and you know well enough to judge. But then that doesn't sound right either. You see, in counseling curricula, it's a pretty well agreed upon uh, statement that the word why is just a terrible word for communication. It's great for scientific studies. It's not good for communication. Why? Because human beings are terrifically complex and no one really knows why they do anything. You wanna test it out? Try asking your child or your teenager, why? Why anything? Why'd you do that? They will bow up and hiss at you like a cat. <laughs> I'm sure that there's somebody back here nodding. <laughs> yeah, try it on a friend or a spouse. Why did you do that? They might do the same, but you know, adults can sometimes regulate that first response, and they might instead try to give you an answer, and it will fall spectacularly short of what you were talking about, because they don't know. How many ways can you respond to that question, why did you do that? As the count of the responses approaches infinity on the X and Y axes, the question is, do you even know yourself well enough to heap judgment there? A lot is going on in this gospel lesson that Beth just read. But as I see it, the thesis statement of it this one and the transfiguration before it is mercy heals. Mercy heals. And the post-op prescription 
is re-inclusion into the community. Mercy and then welcome. That's what I get from this story from a man shouting over a crowd about his only child's afflictions. That's the only way I can get from that fact in Luke to everyone was overwhelmed by God's greatness in Luke. From a man crying out for mercy to everyone in the crowd was overwhelmed by God's greatness in just a few short verses. The only way I can get from one to the other is mercy and welcome. Mercy. Amen. In the church year, Advent and Lent are siblings. Purple and pink candles, purple stoles and pyramids. This has purple in it, in the cross, I think. Don't lie to me. Lie to me if it doesn't. <laughs> Nonetheless, they're siblings, purple and pink pyramids and stoles that represent Christ. That's what they represent. In the church year, Advent and Lent are siblings. Both are seasons of repentance for us and preparation for the highest of Christian holy days. We attend to the Advent wreath right up there in all its brass and evergreen glory at the beginning of worship. Its lights are circular and they spiral in as we go through the season until at last we light the Christ candle, the big white candle in the middle. They're all aflame. The light of the world is born. We attend to the Lenten lights at the end of the service. They're linear and set in wood, not brass. Wood a little bit like a cross. And one by one they fade through the season of Lent until at last on the eve of Easter they're all dark and the light of the world is snuffed out. The time of Lenten lights in our service here during this season is a time set apart for you and for me. Set apart for us to rest in this image, to ponder the journey, to ready our hearts for the mystery and miracle of Monday Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. So for just a few seconds here, do that as we do the Lenten lights together.
Let's pray. God of mercy, we are on a pilgrimage with you. We are headed toward Jerusalem, toward Golgotha, toward the cross, toward a tomb that against all odds we might find, we will find empty. We are on a pilgrimage with you and we ask that you walk it with us, side by side, carry us when we get tired, teach us and show us the way. Show us to love, include, show mercy, that in so doing we will show your greatness to the world. God, as we pilgrimage from here this second Sunday in Lent all the way to Easter Sunday, we want to do it prayerfully. So we as a church again join our voices together and we pray boldly the prayer that will see us through day by day. The prayer that Jesus teaches all of his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's join together in a prayer hymn of response. Number 184, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. And will you stand? 184.
I shared with you a few words from Jan Richardson, a creative type like Beth, and they're the benediction today as well. Light looks different to me in Lent. It's not quite like the light of Advent and Christmas, a jubilant light that emerges from long darkness. For me, Lenten light is the light that gets through what is torn, fractured, frayed, worn. It brings its own kind of joy, a stubborn gladness that comes from having learned and learning still what the Holy One can do with dust. So many blessings to you as we pilgrimage together through Lent. Amen.